get there. Acts chapter number 14, and we're going to start reading in verse number 13. It says, Then the priests of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people. Which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out, and saying, Sirs, why do, ye, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people, that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and from Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead." Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for the reading of your word. Lord, we're thankful for all the blessings you've given to us tonight. Thankful for the good singing. Lord, we're thankful for everything you've done for us. Lord, we're thankful for your touch. Lord, we ask that you just uh, help me tonight, be with what you've laid upon my heart. Lord, if there be anybody here that's lost, Lord, I ask you just touch their hearts, Lord, and help them see their need for salvation. Lord, we do ask you be with those that mailed things back those that drop things off tonight, Lord, we don't know the reason, Lord, but we just ask you convict their hearts wherever they are right now, Lord, that maybe you just do a work in their heart and see them get saved, Lord, before it's everlasting too late. Lord, I ask you just help us tonight, be with what you've laid upon my heart, help it be a strength and encouragement to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing I want to look at by way of introduction is we go back uh, a few verses before we start a reading. And I want us to look at the word and the word that was preached here in verse number 7. Uh, we see in verse number 6 it talks about they fled into Lystra and Derby, And then in verse number 7 and it says, And there they preached the gospel. Uh, it will do us good if we would just listen to the preaching of the gospel. We would listen to the word that was preached. Uh, we had two wonderful messages here on Sunday. Uh, but I want wonder sometimes, well I've already made her mad, that didn't take long at all. We wonder sometimes how much listening do we truly do when the word is preached. We let it go in one ear and out the other. Uh, we can walk into the parking lot and couldn't give and couldn't begin to tell you what was preached on a lot of times. We couldn't begin, we could tell you the preacher's joke, we could tell you the poem, uh, maybe if you had somebody that got up here and sang, maybe you could tell the preacher what he's saying, uh, but can you tell what word was truly preached? So we see the word that was preached in verse number 7, but I want to look at how the word was received in verse number 9. And it says, talking about this impotent man that it begins talking about in verse number 8. And in verse number 9 it says, And the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. Uh, so we know this is what can happen if we're willing to hear the word of God preached. Uh, if we will listen, we have no idea of what he can do in our life. Uh, we can see that there's a, a, the word, the command that's given in verse number 10. Uh, and Paul tells him, he says, And said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaves and walked. You know, I go back and think about to uh, think of this man, Brother Eddie, that, that he talks about he was impotent from his mother's womb. He had never walked. He had never had his feet on the ground to walk. Yet at Paul's command, because he was listening to the preaching, he was listening to the word of God that was being given to him, not only did he receive strength, he immediately started walking, Brother Moore. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but we have a couple of nice, uh, beautiful babies in here tonight. Or I guess one of them must be back there. There's at least one of them in here. Uh, she's not walking yet. Thankful, they're probably very thankful she's not walking just yet, unless they got everything baby proofed already. But they don't come out of the womb just walking. We have to learn that. We acquire that over time, Brother Donald. Uh, first we learn to crawl, and then we learn to walk, and we acquire that over time. Yet once the word was spoken to this man, it says he leaped and he walked. We have no idea sometimes what the Word can do in our life if we would just listen to God's commands. How He might help us and who knows where we might be able to walk into if we would listen to His commands. So we see the Word, but I want us to look at the worship in verse number 11. 
And this isn't a good worship here. And when the people saw that Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down. And if you've got the right Bible, that's a little g. The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. So they are now making them like gods, little g, because they'd seen something they had done, and they wanted to make them like gods, and they wanted to begin to worship them and worship these people. We also see them worshiping their idols, and we see them worshiping and vanities uh, in verse number uh, 13 talks about them wanting to do their sacrifices and 15 uh, talks about their vanities. So we see this worship that they had here of them. We see the witness that it talks about in verse number 17 and uh, verse number 16 first and it says Paul talking who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless he left not himself without witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven fruitful seasons filling our hearts and food and gladness. What's his witness? Look around. Look around outside. It, the Bible tells us we are without excuse not to look and know that God exists. You can't walk outside and look at things and not know that God exists. You can't walk outside and look at everything he's done and not know that there's a God. Not know that there's somebody that's in control of all this. Not know that some, that this didn't just happen, this didn't just come about. Uh, that somebody has to be in control of everything that's going on. Or we'd have, been, we'd have flew off our axis a long, long time ago. But now I want us to look at the wounded down in verse number 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. Now if you remember and this was something that there was a lady at the jail on Sunday that she asked a question I believe brother Phil evidently last week you must have preached or taught something on Paul I guess maybe in the jail and she said because I'm pretty sure she told me she goes my brother Phil taught last week about Paul she said why did he change his name? Why was his name changed? So I went in to tell her some things about the Bible and how they why their names would change and those things but if you know anything if we know Paul we know that he we see him show up as Saul and he's at the stoning of Stephen. And now here he himself is being stoned. He himself is going through the torture of this stoning. All the way to the point that it talks about they drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. So he is stoned so bad that he's laying there and they think he might be dead. They think there is a chance that he is dead. That there's nothing else they can do and we can go. And, and, and it talks about in verse number 20, how be it as the disciples stood round about him. Uh, there, there's a lot of things you can read about why they were around him. Some think they were protecting him. Some think they were just trying to keep nobody else from getting to him. They were going to see what was going to happen. But either way, they thought he was dead. And then think about the what. And then when I say what, I mean this is put yourself in that situation. You've just watched Paul get stoned. You see them drag him out of the city and he's laying there and you're thinking he's dead. But in verse number 20, he rose up. Sure. I, now, now that you can just read that, maybe you just read that and go right on, but I've been like, what? What's going on here? Right. Because it says he rose up and came into the city. So we thought he was dead. He didn't just raise up and sat there. You know, you watch movies and you see somebody get beat up and they, they got to raise up and shake it off and get themselves cleaned up, whatever it be. He rose up and started walking, Brother Moore, and went back into the city. I'd have been like, whoa, what's going on here? But then I want us to look at the wow in verse number 21. It says, and when they had preached the gospel to that, in verse number 20, it talks about he departed to Derby. And then in verse number 21, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, and he had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Why did I say wow? I'm not going back, Brother Phil. I'm not going back, Brother Ron. I go over to the jail on Sunday. Look, it's easy to stand and say, Hey, Brother Ray, we'll do anything for God. You let me get stoned to near death. I might not be as fast as to go back the way they did. They immediately went about doing God's business to the next city. And then as soon as they were done there, they immediately returned back where they had just stoned Paul and left him for dead. Wow. Why did he do that? Verse number 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Right. 
Can I say he went by because he made sure he knew those people still needed taught? He knew those people that may have been converted still needed something. Why? Because he wanted to see them continue to grow even if he wasn't going to be there. He knew his journey would be he wasn't going to stay in that city. He knew what those people needed. Why? Because he had a passion for those people. He had a passion to see something happen in their lives. He had a passion, Brother Eddie, to see those things get done that God had called him to do. He had a, you had to have had a passion to see the Word of God preached to them if you're going to return from being stoned. If you're going to be stoned and be left for dead, you have to have a passion for the people if you're going to return back and take the chance on having that happen again. Right. Can I say this, also, this was a... Uh, if you want to know where this all come about, there was a couple of Sunday nights ago, and, and I don't remember what she was doing, and I was hoping that maybe I'd waited long enough, maybe she wouldn't show up and wouldn't watch, and then I wouldn't have to hear about this later. Brother Aaron already knows what I'm talking about because he already looked over and seen Miss Tina just walked in. And so a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night, I don't remember now what she was doing, and she was on her phone, Brother Ray, and we pulled up into the car, and, and we pulled up and we parked outside there and we were sitting there and she was still sitting and I got out and walked around and most of the time like any good husband does brother Eddie I got up and I was just going to walk in and so Bella got out and I was joking I said is, is mom sitting there waiting on me to open the door for her and when I went to go open the door she opened it and she got out and I think she even said that she goes did dad ask if I was waiting on him to open the door and she goes I used to not have to wait he would just do that and that got me thinking we did used to do that sometimes. Maybe not all the time, Brother Ray, but we did sometimes. Brother Ray's like, nope, I never did that. She got out on her own. But some of us fellas, maybe Brother Jack did. Maybe Brother Jack every now and then opened the door for Miss Cinda. I don't know. But all of us think back to when you were dating. Take, think back to when you was uh, maybe trying to win her heart. Think back to those times and that passion that we showed and the, the time and effort we would put in to win their hearts and get that second date or whatever it may be. Think back to that time when you first got married and just uh, the passion, so to speak, that might be in your marriage. Think back to those times and you would just, you would do anything to spend time with them. You would do anything to get them to go out with you again or so to speak. And over time, that passion just wanes. And you just begin to go through the motions and just do the same thing over and over and over again. Now think back to that time when you first got saved. Think back to maybe when whatever, maybe it was in a, a, a car somewhere, maybe it was in a church, maybe it was at home, wherever it may have been that first time that God, when God saved you. And think of that passion you had because you wanted to see anything done. You, you was ready to, to charge hell with a water pistol. You, you was coming asking a pastor, what can I do? What, what, what can I be a part of? What, what do you need help with? Or whatever it may be. And that passion you had to serve the Lord. Right. And then all of a sudden, Brother Brian, people hurt you at the church house. Maybe just all of a sudden now, maybe when you got saved, maybe you were somebody that's one of these young people. And all of a sudden now you're grown and you've been married. You've got two or three kids that take up your time and, and they're doing this or doing that. And all of a sudden the church is important. We still go. We're not going to stop going to church. But that passion for the things of God just isn't there the way it once was. That's what I'm going to preach on this tonight. It's just this, that simple thought. Where's our passion? Where's our passion? Can I say first off, where's our passion in our walk? It was talked a little bit here about on, on Sunday. Uh, Brother Ron was talking about his family and talked about those that profess to be saved and those that profess to, uh, to know the Lord, but their walk doesn't show it. Where's our passion in our walk? How many times do we walk out of here and we immediately want to put Jesus up on a shelf, so to speak? How many times do we walk out of here on a Sunday night and we're going to put him up on the shelf until Wednesday rolls around and then we'll get him down? How many times is our, what kind of passion do we put in our walk? Think of Job. What was Job in chapter, in, in Job chapter number one? Job was a perfect, upright man, one who feared, who feared God and eschewed evil. Can the, why was that said about him, Brother Phil? Because his walk showed that. His everyday walk showed the type of person he was. When you look at Noah, and what does it say about Noah? It talks about Noah, and it talks about everything that God had found in the world. But it says, but Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Why did he find that? Because that's how his walk found him. Because his walk showed that. Where is our passion in our walk? Oh, I love God, and, and, and I want to do anything for God as long as I'm at church on Sunday or Wednesday. 
But if I'm on the job on Monday, eh, my walk might be a little worldly. Right. No, where's our passion in our walk? That no matter what comes our way, I'm going to follow God. That no matter what somebody says, I'm going to walk the way I know I'm supposed to walk. I'm not going to dabble in the world. I'm not going to get all caught up in the nonsense I don't need to get caught up in. I'm going to continue to walk with the Lord no matter what. Amen. See, we don't have that same passion. We have that passion when it comes to the things of the world, but we don't necessarily have that passion when it comes to the things of God. We're willing to walk on that line. We're willing to tiptoe on that line. All you have to look as you can see is the certain things. You know, I, 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 well, it was Brother Ron even talked about on uh, uh, Sunday morning, I believe, when he talked about politicians and those things. Like, if you're for homosexuality, I ain't voting for you. If you're for abortion, I ain't voting for you. But too many times there might be certain things that, well, you know, but I like him on this or I like him on that, so therefore I'm going to vote. Because we don't want to adhere and we don't have a passion for our walk. What difference could we make out in the world if we were passionate about our walk? If we were passionate about how we walk with the Lord outside those doors the same as we are inside those doors. I would venture to say that that little note that I read before service that that lady sent, uh, that, that a lot of us were on that on fire, and you might want to, uh, we might not have been what you might want to call a Jesus freak, but we was on fire for God at that certain point in our life too. But are we now? Our walk don't show that outside of these doors. Amen. Not only where is our passion for our walk, where is our passion in our worship? Can I say this? And I am not, uh, uh, I am not near the sports fan that I used to be. I will watch sports. Uh, if it's on TV, if we're not doing anything else especially, I will turn on a ball game. Uh, you get to playoff time like baseball right now, and I'll watch it, but i do not near as enthralled with it as I once was. But it still amazes, and it's been said from this pulpit before, how much we are willing, we will jump up, we'll scream and shout and holler and yell and do all those things when it comes to sports. And then we come in here, and I wish, you know, hey, maybe it's just my preaching. Maybe Brother Doug don't see any of this stuff. Maybe Brother Ron didn't see this on Sunday, or Brother Moore on Sunday night. Maybe you all didn't. But it amazes me when we come in here and sit, and everybody just sitting back here. Where's the, where is the passion in our worship? Why is it that we can come in and just sit like a knot on the log and go about our business here at church and we never seem to worship Him? Sure. How can we not come in and show some type of emotion? I'm not telling you you got to jump up and scream and shout and we don't have to hang from the chandeliers and throw babies and all that kind of stuff. But you would think we would show some kind of emotion. Right. Maybe a tear. Maybe you'd want to, you know, when I asked who, who had any, I, I've told Bella, if you, if you want to sing, you've got to raise your hand. Right. You know, and so when I asked if anybody want to sing, she, she's trying to, she's getting up a little bit higher than, than normal. But you would think at least somewhere along the line, you would get that little woo, right. that we would show something, have a passion in our worship. Yeah. But we seem to come, and I'm not trying to be mean or ugly, but it seems like we just come in and we drag in and go back out because it's what we do on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. We don't come in with any passion to truly worship. We don't come in with any passion that no matter who it is singing, no matter who it is preaching, of just being willing to get behind them and shout or whatever it may be or, or go to the altar and pray if that's what God tells us to do, but just have a passion in our worship. Where's our passion in our walk? Where's our passion in our worship? Can I say this? Where's our passion in our words? What do you mean, Brother Joshua, in our words? And I, this goes way deeper than just talking about the Lord. Let me say this. Come here. I want you to do something for me. I want you to stand right back here by Brother Josh. Face me. How many times do you walk into church... And you have somebody else walking up there, and you walk by and say, Hi, buddy, how you doing? Hi, buddy, how you doing? Hi, buddy, how you doing? Did you give anybody a chance to answer? Amen. Amen. Do we care? You sit down. Thank you, buddy. We just walk by, and we just throw out words. Hey, how you doing? Do we care? When was the last time we walked up, and we shook somebody's hand, and we said, Hey, Brother Brian, how you doing today, buddy? How things going? I'm good. I'm wonderful. And took time to truly listen to them. Where's our passions in our words? Sure. Husbands, wives, when was the last time you told your spouse you loved them and it wasn't just a, hey, love you, bye? Yeah. Amen. That you truly said, I love you, like you meant it. Right. Where's our passions in our words? 
There are many times that, that we get very passionate. You know, I seen this, I believe it was on, uh, it was Sunday afternoon, uh, Brother Thad, I guess, and the Reds playing at St. Louis, and Joey Votto, you don't know if he's going to, he plays for the Reds, I'm sure most of you hopefully know, most of you all know that, that we don't know if he's going to retire, what he's going to do, and I guess he got thrown out in the first inning of the game. What was going to be his last game, he got thrown out by yelling at the umpire from the dugout, something he couldn't do. We're the same way. We will yell at the TV like they can hear us. Come on, ump, that was a strike, that was a ball, whatever, that was a foul. How did you not call that? We'll yell at the TV. We're very passionate about our words yelling at things like that. But how passionate are we about our words one to another? When we ask somebody how they are, well, how about this? And we've heard this even preach from here before. If you walk up and you tell somebody, if, if our... You walk around and you shake somebody's hands and, and Brother Eddie's dealing with his knee right now and you tell him that you're going to pray for him. Do you mean that? Did you pray for him? Was you truly passionate about what you said or was it just words because I'm supposed to tell him I'm praying for him. I'm a good church member. I told him I was going to pray for him. When our pastor called this morning, I prayed for his angiogram because I'm a good church member. That's what I'm supposed to do. Or are you truly passionate about those things? It is amazing how passionate we can be when it comes to our words talking to the world about things of the world. Well, you bring up politics to some people, Brother Ray, and we can get furious and we can get mad and we can get serious on telling who you need to vote for and this and that. What about the Bible? Do we have that same passion in conveying things about the Bible to people? Do we have the same passion and say, let me tell you what my God's done for me. Let me tell you how my God can help. Let me tell you how my God can do things. And I say this on a side note. This is completely, this just has to do, this popped into my mind now, so I'm going to say it. So as most of you, all of you know, besides being visitors, we had a daughter that got married. And that daughter's no longer here. And she moved three hours away. Well, Tina don't even know this yet, but I got a text message tonight. So Bella has been doing unified bowling for the last two years. Those bowling nights, Brother Ray, have been on Wednesday for the last two years. So now I'm in a conundrum. What am I going to do? Caitlin's not here to be able to say, hey, when you get off work, I'll take Bella to bowling, drop her off. Can you go pick her up? Because I got to go to church. I'm going to church. Can you pick her up? And whenever you get done, you can come or whatever. Well, I get a text message today from somebody that says, hey, do you know when Bella's bowling starts? It's like, nope. She wasn't uh, able to go to the meeting the other day, so we haven't gotten all the, you know, all the info yet, but I just know it starts sometime here pretty soon. And they texted me back and said, well, we got this schedule, Brother Donald, and bowling is on Tuesdays this year. Don't tell me God can't work things out if you're just serious and you don't ask him to help you. God, you're going to have to work this out because I know how much she loves it. I know how much she enjoys it. I don't want her to miss it, but I can't take her on Wednesdays anymore. Well, lo and behold, it's going to be on Tuesdays. And not only is that going to work out for us, Tina will even be able to get to watch. She's not been to, I think, any of them to get to watch her bowl because she would always have to work. God can do great things if we are willing to use our words and ask him. And we're passionate about those things. We're passionate about all the things of the world, but how much in our words are we passionate? Can I say this? How passionate are we about our wisdom? In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15, we all know this verse, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If I was to ask you tonight what the TV lineup is for Thursday night, would you know the TV lineup for Thursday night better or would you know what was preached on Sunday night better? Would you know the TV lineup for Friday night better? Or could you recite the books of the Bible better? Could we make it past Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Could we make it any farther past those things? Those first four or five books in each one. Could we make it past those things? How passionate are we about our wisdom when it comes to God? It is amazing how much we will know, uh, you know, we can tell you who's on our sports teams, we can tell you, and I'm not trying to pick on you boys, I do it too, we can tell you about who's on our fantasy football teams, we can tell you about, uh, we can tell you how many hits Pete Rose had, we can tell you how many strikeouts Nolan Ryan had, we can tell you how many titles Michael Jordan won, uh, we could tell you, uh, I could tell you how many uh, titles Tony Stewart won, and who you like was Tony Stewart, that'd be zero, right? But Dale Earnhardt won seven so I'm just I'm just trying to pick on Thad because I hadn't picked on him yet we can tell you all these things about the world but how much do we know about the Bible Amen. how much do we truly know about the Bible 
If I was to open up and, and, and read something out of the Bible, would you know enough to know if I had, uh, you, you know, by, by no means would I, but if I just had a, a different Bible up here and told you not to turn to anything and I was just starting to read, would you know enough to know? That's not in the Bible. That's not, that's not right. right. He's not reading what's right. How passionate are we knowing about the things of God? How passionate are we? Everybody, this is something that confounds me. None of us are going to know everything. The Bible tells us the half has yet been told, so we're not going to know everything. Our pastor will tell you he still learns things every day that we read and study the Bible. But it amazes me sometimes how excited we get if we hear that somebody's going to preach on the end times or something of that nature, Brother Moore, and shouldn't we know a lot of those things already? Like how many times, like, why aren't we studying those things for ourselves? Why, why does it excite us so much? Well, I can't wait to learn what they're going to talk about. Well, why haven't you learned, learned those things on your own? We're, we're, we're in, we obviously are in the last days. The world is full of questions. We should know those things to be able to answer to them. We shouldn't wait on the pastor to have to teach us those things. How passionate are we about the, our wisdom? How passionate are we about knowing what God has for us? It's amazing that the more you study and the closer you get to him, the more that he can help you. The more you can look at all this nonsense going on and just have peace about things. I know God's going to take care of things. I don't know when, don't know how sometimes. Sometimes it might look bleak, but I still know that God's going to take care of things. I still know that, that his word tells me that, you know what, at the end of the day, I'm going to have a bad day sometimes. Brother Clint, at the end of the day, I might feel like that light at the end of the tunnel is a train about to run me over. But also, at the end of the day, I know that we win. At the end of the day, I still know where I'm going. And I know that from studying the Word of God and, having, uh, and just having that peace of God that only He can give. It is amazing to me some of the things that I'll listen to and, and people will talk about things in the Bible and you'll hear people make things talking about that they hope that when they get to heaven, but yet they claim that they're saved. I'm like, I don't have to hope, Brother Josh. I know. If, if I know the Bible and I know that I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven. I don't have to hope, Brother Tommy. I'm not worried about losing it. But some of those things that people say and some of those things that they do because they just don't study. They don't know enough and even put any time and effort into studying God's Word. When we're passionate about it, if we do go a day and maybe you wake up and you're, you, you've overslept and all of a sudden you don't read and when we're passionate about it and you get to the end of the day, you're like, I need to get my Bible out. I haven't read my Bible yet today. I haven't studied or read like I want to. And you'll have that desire to do it. Where's our passion when it comes to our wisdom? Can I say this lastly? Where's our passion when it comes to our work? Can I say, take a look at the church. Isn't it beautiful? It looks this way because two dear ladies had a passion to make sure it looked good. It looks this way on the outside because of people who have a passion and take passion in what they do and trying to keep the grounds looking the way they do. I know a lot of you, maybe you might fly by because you come in last minute, maybe you come in the back. Have you looked at how beautiful all the flowers and everything are out front? Now, I, I, I'm not saying this because I like him, and I'm not saying this because he's my friend. I don't know how much attention you pay, but I, I don't know that I've ever come in and the yard not just look pristine every single time this year. It looks wonderful. Now, if you go back to the back and you go back and get the van like I do, you also know the work that he's put in. He's got 75 traps set every week trying to catch the moles that are trying to tear our yard up. He's doing all that he can. Why? Because he takes a passion and loves what he gets to do for the Lord. What about us? Do we put that same passion into what we're doing? Amen. Can I say some of us, there's not a chance we'd miss work tomorrow. We could wake up running a fever. We could make up feel like we've been hit by a dump truck. We could wake up feeling like we're just not going to make it to the end of the day, but by golly, I'm going to get up and go to work. And if Sunday comes around, and look, I know this isn't work to come to church. I get that. I understand that. But Sunday comes around... And we sneeze, Pastor, I can't be there this morning. I'm not feeling good. Yeah. Amen. Where's our passion for our work? Now, I understand that's not work. That's We come in here to worship. I get that. But what about when it comes to our work and the things for God? Do we put that same type of effort into the things that we do for God, into the things that we do for our worldly jobs? 
I've talked to, we, our pastor has talked about, and we've talked about these kids that will go out on visitation on Monday nights, and you can't hardly even keep up with them. I, I believe it was uh, Brother Phil dropped, I think it was Brother Phil or somebody, a couple of them, we dropped off a couple of weeks ago, and two of the boys went with them, and I picked them back up, and he's like, I didn't even do a single house. He goes, I just walked on the sidewalk and just handed them bags, they just went flying past me. They have a passion to get the gospel out. And some of us, and look, I'm not trying to pick, I hope nobody's this way. We, we sneeze on a Monday night. Hey, Brother Josh, can't come. Not feeling good. Where's our passion in the things that we do for him? Look at everything he's done for us. Look at everything that he has brought us from. Everything that he blesses us with. And we can't put forth a little bit of effort to do something for him. We can't put forth just a little bit of effort. Maybe I am going to go out on visitation. Or maybe I am going to go be a part of the shut-in ministry. Or maybe I am going to give up a little bit of my Saturday to be part of the homeless ministry or whatever it may be. Can we not put forth a little bit of effort and show a little bit of passion when it comes to working for Him? Amen. Can I say that that note that we got only comes from people having a passion wanting to do something for God? It's easy, it is easy to blow something like that off. I don't need to go any extra, Brother Ray. I go on Sunday mornings. If she can't come on Sunday mornings, that's her problem. That's easy to try to say that. It's not spiritual by no stretch of the imagination. But how many times are we like that? How many times does God tell us maybe we need to go talk to that neighbor, we need to go talk to that coworker? I've already invited him to church 15 times, Josh. I ain't got to invite him again. I ain't going to go ask him again. We not wanted to do anything for him. But if we felt the need to go talk to him about sports, or to go talk to him about a soap opera, or go talk to him about some TV show or about politics, well, we'd have no problem running right up to him. Right. But to talk to him again about God, nah, that's just too much trouble. Where's our passion in our works for him? We're running out of time. Right. We cannot look and be honest with ourselves and not say that we are running out of time. Where's our passion in our work for the Lord? And, and I, you know, it, this just this popped into my mind. I don't want to embarrass him. I, I don't want to try to call him out or anything like that. Wouldn't do that for the world. But it just popped into my mind. How many of you, if God told you to sell your house and move to Brother Adrian come for Virginia, right? What if God told you to sell your house and go to Virginia and do something? Are you going to do it? Oh, is exactly right, Brother Phil. I've lived here all my life. I've been in Emmanuel Baptist Church 20-some years. I ain't moving there. I ain't going there. Ain't no way. I don't know anybody. I'm not starting over. Not going to do it. I asked Brother Mike Goodson the last time he was up, and he, I asked him, I said, that church, I believe it, I think it was Montana, I don't remember where it was at, I asked him if they had a pastor yet. And he's like, no, they still haven't found anybody yet. He goes, and Brother Phil, he said, God's going to have to send somebody there. You're not going to go just to go. That's the problem, Brother Ron. Nobody wants to go just to go. But they won't allow God to send them there even if God tried to tell them to. I don't want to go someplace that I'm 150 miles from the closest Walmart. I don't want to have to go someplace that I just, you know, there's 30 or 40 people and that's all they're going to be out there. I don't want to do something like that. They don't even allow God to call and use them for something. Why? Because they're not passionate about the work. Passionate about the work is when you're willing to uplift everything and leave everything, bring everything that you have, all 37 truckloads or whatever it was that he talked about, and come to Kentucky not knowing anybody because God told you to. How many of us are passionate, are that passionate about anything? We're not willing too many times across the street, much less go to a different state. Where is our passion when it comes to working for the things of God? Our time is running out. There are people dying every day and going to hell. Neighbors, church members, family members, co-workers, every day dying and going to hell and they're dying and going to hell because we don't have a passion to do a work for the Lord. We have a passion to talk to him about politics or anything else, but not to talk to him about God. Where's our passion? Where's our passion? Why, why do we allow the things of God, why do we treat that the same way we do our own personal relationships sometimes? That over time, we've just kind of gotten where we go through the routine, and we have no longer have that passion that we once had. Sure. We no longer have that drive and that energy that we once did. Oh, she knows I love her. I don't need it, but brother, brother, our pastor has talked to us many times, talked about, uh, uh, um, oh my goodness, uh, brother Bill Warnicky talking about, hey, I told Miss Eloise one time I loved her. That was enough. 
And we laugh about that, and we think about that. And well, I tell my wife every day I love her. Do you mean it? What about when it comes to God? Oh, I tell him every day that I love him. Do we mean it? Do we show it? Are we passionate about it? Or are we just going through the motions? Hey, I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven, and that's all I need to know. Where's our passion tonight? Brother Daniel, you come. Uh, Brother Clint, you come get a song of invitation. I'll ask everybody to stand. I invite you to come tonight. Where's your passion? Are you still as passionate about doing things for God and, and doing whatever it is He has for you as you was the day you got saved? Or has that passion over time just waned? Have you just slowly lost that passion for maybe teaching your Sunday school class or teaching the kids or going to the jail or preaching or whatever it may be? Have you just slowly lost passion over time or do you still have that same passion for the things of God that you once did? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you, Lord. We're thankful for the message you've laid upon my heart. Lord, we're thankful for each and everything you've done for us. Lord, I ask you to speak to hearts during this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.